Good morning, church. How are you this morning? Are you happy to be in the house? Are you full of life? Full of fire? Now, I know some of you have heard this before, but when Paul was preaching, the word says that someone actually fell asleep and they fell out of a window and they died. And you'd think that would be the end of the service. But Paul actually went down and he raised that person back to life. And the word says that he then preached until the sun came up. Now, I don't know if this is theologically correct, but it could have been because the people weren't being responsive. <laughs> and so I want to invite you to be responsive this morning, not just for your own benefit, but for those around you. Do what you have to do. You want to jump up and say, preach it, white boy, or amen, or, you know, I'm part Asian. Some of you don't know that. We have Asian heritage, and down in Belito, they used to say, preach it, my China. If you want to say that, you're welcome to, but come on, let's stir ourselves. I really believe that God is going to speak to us if we open our hearts to receive this morning. So come on, put your hand on your heart, and let's commit this time to the Lord. Father, we're so grateful to be in the house together. But Lord, we don't just want to go through the motions today. We don't just want to tick a Sunday box. We don't just need an experience. We need to have an encounter with the living God. So Lord, I pray that you would speak into every heart, that you would speak into every life. I pray, Lord, that we would leave this place different from the way that we've come in, that we would be inspired, encouraged, equipped, and motivated to be the people that you've called us to be. Pray that you would remove all distractions, any tiredness, doubt, skepticism, fear, anxiety, sickness, anything that would get in the way of us hearing from you. We commit this time to you in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. 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 You can be seated. We've recently been walking through the book of James in Kyle Army, and it's been great to study the Word together uh, a little deeper, a bit more of a, a deeper dive, as you've done here in Santon with Pastor Andre. And hopefully as you've done that, it, it has inspired you and equipped you to study the Word in your own time as well, and not to, just to gloss over it or you know, to cherry pick a few verses here and there as we often like to do. God's Word is rich, it is deep, it is powerful, and it never returns void. Amen. N.T. Wright was a, an English author and theologian who said, the Bible is the book of my life. It is the book I live with, the book I live by, the book I want to die by. Elizabeth Elliot was a Christian author and motivational speaker. She said, the Word of God I think of as a straight edge which shows up our own crookedness. We can't really tell how crooked our thinking is until we line it up with the straight edge of Scripture. And with that in mind, I want to speak to you out of the book of James chapter 4 today because I believe that it speaks to a lot of the things that we're seeing in the world, a lot of the things that we're seeing in the church. And I'll give you the title in just a moment, but I first want to give you some background to the book of James. It was written by the apostle James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't believe in his brother Jesus at first. I mean, Come on, if your brother or sister came to you and said, hey, listen, I'm actually God. I mean, how many of you would? <laughs> but after Jesus uh, is crucified and, and, and he's resurrected, the word tells us that he appears to James. James becomes fully convinced, because you'd have to be, to become a servant of your brother or sister. And he becomes a key figure in the early church. In fact, he heads up the church in Jerusalem, and he goes on to write this letter as a practical call for Christians to grow and mature in Christ. 
He's not telling us how to be saved. Paul spends a lot of time speaking to us about how to be saved. James is not telling us how to be saved. He's telling us how those who are saved ought to live and conduct themselves. In chapter 2, he, he says that if we have a true saving faith, which is often referred to as a living dynamic faith, that it will be seen in our deeds by, by the way we live our lives. He says faith without works is dead. Now, he's not talking about works of the law. He's talking about deeds of righteousness, good deeds, that there should be fruit and evidence in your life. He says if you have an intellectual faith where you only know about Jesus, well, that's a dead faith because if you only know about him, it's not enough to transform your life. He says if you have an emotional response to the fact that Jesus is real, well, you're no different to the, the demons. He says that's demonic faith because even the demons believe that there's only one God and they have an emotional response to that. They tremble or they shudder. How many of you know that emotional response is not enough to get the demons saved? He says, no, you need a, a true living dynamic faith that leads to transformation. And real transformation, church, is something that you can see in my life and it can be seen in yours. In chapter 3, he says that if we have the wisdom that comes from heaven called divine wisdom, that will also be seen in the way we live our lives. James 3 and verse 13, and I'm just setting up the message this morning. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So you and I are not just saved to carry on living in sin. Oh, you know, I'm saved by grace, so I'll just carry on. No, there needs to be transformation. In fact, in Ephesians 2, Paul tells us that we are saved by grace through faith. So, so that is the work that God does for us. You and I cannot do it for ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. No, it's, it's by grace through a real transforming faith that you and I are saved. It's the work that God does for us, but, but that's not where it ends. He says that we are God's handiwork. So there's something that God wants to do for us, which is salvation, but then he wants to do something in us called sanctification. But that's also not the end of the story. He, he has called us to good works of service. That's what God does through us. He wants to do something for you. He wants to do something in you as you journey forward. And very importantly, he wants to do something through your life to change the world for his glory and for your benefit. Are you ready to jump into James chapter 4 this morning? And if you need a title, I've called the message, The Cause and Cure of Conflict. The Cause and Cure of of conflict. I don't know about you, but I, I don't particularly like conflict. I was having a conversation with someone this week and was saying some people actually really enjoy conflict. I like conflict from the point of view that when you, when you work through it, you're better for it. You've sorted out the issue and you can move on and there's unity and there's something great that can come out of it, but it's not something that we all like. James 4, reading from verse 1, and you can follow in your Bible or on the screen, I'm reading from the nearly infallible version. And my word, time ticketh exceedingly quicketh. James 4 and verse 1 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? The King James Version says, Where do wars and fights come from? Now, war is a fact of life. Not only are there wars between nations, but in almost every sphere of life, you will find war or you will find some kind of conflict. And James highlights three types in the next few verses. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? So the first type of war is that we're at war with ourselves. The war within causes a war without. What rages in the heart will ultimately display itself in the life. Amen? And wars always start in hearts. That's why war will never be eradicated. Despite many articles that have been written and studies that have been done, 
you know, all, all, all trying to figure out how do we make some lasting change in our world and eradicate all war. Well, the problem is the heart of man. You and I cannot look to a problem heart to find the solution. We have to look to God and get divine wisdom. And when you and I look within, James says all we find is earthly, unspiritual wisdom, and that kind of wisdom only leads to chaos and confusion in our lives. Romans 12 and verse 2 says, be transformed by the renewal of the mind. Anakinosis is the word that, that is used, and it's found in Titus 3, 5 as well. It says, he, that's God, saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal, same word, of the Holy Spirit. Well, well why is that important? Well, it tells us that you and I can change. No, a, 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 a human being can actually change. A, a, a dog can't change. My dog, Indy, can't decide one day that he's going to go off and get a job because he's tired of, you know, chasing birds and, you know, lying around all day in the sun. Now, you and I can change, but our hearts and minds have to change. The system has to change. Otherwise, nothing will change. And it's only through God that we see lasting change. James says your conflicts come from the desires within you. The word desires there, some translations use the word pleasures. It's the ancient Greek word hedone, which is where we get the term hedonism from. It means the pursuit of pleasure or sensual self-indulgence. You see, church, the essence of sin is selfishness. This is what James says in the previous chapter James 3 and verse 14, he says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So selfishness leads to every evil practice, in other words, sin, and sin keeps you and I at war. In Romans 7:22. Paul says, I love to do God's will so far as my new nature is concerned, but there is something else deep within me in my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. So the wars, the fights, the quarrels, they get their start in the heart. They come from within. We're at war with ourselves. Verse 2, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. How many of you know 2,000 years later and nothing has changed? Second type of war is that we're at war with each other. And James is clearly addressing disunity or, or conflict within the church and within the lives of these believers, he uses the, the term, uh, what causes conflict among you? That term among you tells us that he's speaking to a community of believers. It also reminds us that fights and quarrels for you and I as believers come from the same place as they do for the unsaved, from the heart. And you might say, well, hang on a sec. <laughs> you know, I might look at what other people have and, you know, I might kind of aspire to that. Nothing wrong. You know, I want to be successful, but I don't kill. Well, look what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Verse 21, he says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. Now that word raka is best translated as nitwit, idiot, you know, knucklehead. In fact, they say that it's, it's less of a word or a phrase, it's more of a gesture, like going <laughs> None of us ever do that, of course. <laughs> but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Now, Jesus isn't saying that when you call people idiots in the traffic, just look straight ahead this morning. <laughs> He's not saying that that's just as bad as murdering them. He's saying that even though there is 
a punishment. There is a legal system that punishes murder, but it doesn't punish you for calling someone an idiot in the traffic. Doesn't mean that those two things don't come from the same place. A sinful heart that is in conflict with itself and with one another. Psalm 33 and verse 1 says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. In contrast, how, how terrible it is when there's conflict and disunity and backbiting and a competitive spirit within the body. He goes on to say, you do not have because you do not ask God. So there's a lack of prayer or you, you're not asking God, you're asking the wrong source. Then he goes on to say in verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. So selfish desires lead to wrong actions, killing and fighting, but it also leads to wrong praying. Warren Wearsby in his book, Be Mature, which is a study on the book of James, says when our praying is wrong, our whole Christian life is wrong. It has well been said that the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on the earth. So he says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Hayden A. Charles Spurgeon, who's the often referred to as the prince of preachers, he says the whole of human, uh, sorry, the whole history of mankind rather shows the failure of evil lustings to obtain their object. So we fight and we wage war with one another and we ask God so that we can get stuff, but what we get never satisfies. It's a vicious cycle because when what you want is birthed out of selfish ambition or, or lust, it's never going to truly satisfy you. You know, people who are at war with themselves because of selfish desires, they are unhappy people. They are never satisfied. And that dissatisfaction, that unhappiness spills over into their relationship with God and their relationship with other people. Verse 4, I hope this is helping you this morning. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So we are at war with ourselves, we are at war with one another, and then we are at war with God. Think about this, the root cause of every war, internal and external, is rebellion against God. How does a believer declare war against God? Well, by being friendly with God's enemies. And James lists three enemies here that I want to highlight this morning because fraternizing with God's enemies will not give you and I peace with our Heavenly Father. Firstly, the first enemy is the world. Verse 4 in the NLT says, You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? An adulterer is someone who is unfaithful. And you and I cannot be faithful to God and to the world. Listen, the system of this world is anti-God. It is anti-Christ. Perhaps now more than ever. And many Christians can't seem to stay the course because they want to kind of live like the world and then tack Jesus on as an added extra. And often it's subtle. You know, we, we take little cues from the world, little bits of culture, a few thoughts and a few ideas. Before you know it, you've made friends with the world, and then we, we call it being contemporary. Oh, you know, we, we need to be relevant. I see it all over social media. People put scriptures in their bio, or a little church emoji, or the, the Latin cross. It's that little purple one with the cross on it. But then when you go onto their feed, it tells a different story. When you go onto their WhatsApp status, ooh, tells a different story. Maybe it would be better not to put those scriptures in the bio. You see, we want to live and speak and present like the world, yet still be friends with God. It doesn't work. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Abraham was called a friend of God, James tells us in, in chapter 2, verse 23. But Abraham's nephew, 
Lot, he was a friend of the world. And as a result, Lot ends up in a war and Abraham has to go and rescue him. Second enemy of God is the flesh. Verse 1, James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? In other words, in your flesh? In 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter says, Dearly beloved, I implore you as aliens and refugees. Listen, you and I need to remember that we are aliens and strangers. We're not meant to fit into the pattern of this world, the thinking of this age. No, no, we are actually aliens and strangers to it, even though we're called to reach it. I implore you as aliens and refugees, Abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Verse 5, or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us? The Holy Spirit has this jealous yearning for our friendship with God. Warren Wiersbe says this, there is a holy loving jealousy that a husband and wife have over each other and rightly so. The Spirit within, that's the Holy Spirit, jealously guards our relationship to God, and the Spirit is grieved when we sin against God's love. Living to please the old nature, that's the flesh, an enemy of the Lord, means to declare war against God. Verse 6, but He gives us more grace. Thank you, Jesus. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Third enemy of God is the devil. The world is in conflict with the Father, the flesh is in conflict with the Holy Spirit, and the devil opposes the Son, Jesus. You see, Satan's greatest sin was and still is pride. James says here, God opposes the proud. By the way, this statement is found three times in Scripture. Here in James 4, it's found in Proverbs 3 and in 1 Peter 5. It tells us that this is an important principle. Ezekiel 28 and verse 17 says this about Satan. It says, your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Therefore, I've cast you down to the ground and exposed you helpless before the curious gaze of kings. Listen, his weakness, pride, is the weapon that he still uses against you and I today. He wants you and I to look at ourselves and think, wow, I'm all that in a bag of potato chips. I'm amazing. I'm intelligent. I've got a brain. I'm beautiful. I'm wonderful. I don't really need God. And not only does the enemy want us to embrace our pride, he actually wants us to celebrate our pride. Satan is the author of the do-it-yourself spiritual movement. He wants you and I to depend on ourselves instead of depending on God and His grace. But He gives us more grace. Spurgeon says, sin seeks to enter, grace shuts the door. Sin gets us down at times and puts its foot on our neck. Grace comes to the rescue. Do you suffer from spiritual poverty? It is your own fault, for he giveth more grace. If you have not got it, it is not because it is not to be had, but because you have not gone for it. Why? Why do we not go for the grace that God gives us? Because of pride. Grace comes to those who are humble enough to receive it. How many of you know you can't receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you don't humble yourself and admit your need for Him? <clears throat> Wearsby makes this very sobering statement about pride within the church, and, and he said this back in 2008, which I think makes it even more powerful. He says, one of the problems in our churches today is that we have too many celebrities and not enough servants. Christian workers are promoted so much that there is very little place left for God's glory. Man has nothing to be proud of in himself. There dwells no good thing in us, but when we trust Christ, He puts that good thing in us that makes us His children. It's not about us. It's all about Him. 
And God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble and he gives them more grace. I hope you're being helped. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Because here in verse 7, James offers a solution to the war within, the war with others, and the war with God. He gives us this strategy, and I want to share these three points with you before we close. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. So first part of the strategy, submit to God. That word submit is a, a military term Hupotasso in the Greek, it means to arrange troops in a military fashion under the command of a leader. How many of you know submission is only submission when you want to go your own way, you want to do your own thing, but instead of doing that, you fall in line with the authority that's over you. When Pastor Andre tells me to do something in Kyle Army and I agree with the decision, that's not submission. That's agreement. When you go to the Word of God and you see something in Scriptures and you're like, whoo, I can get behind that, that is agreement. But when He tells me to do something that I don't like and I've got my own idea but I do it anyway, that's submission. And James is speaking to Christians here. He's saying if you want to deal with the enemies of God, the world, the flesh, and the devil, you have to be fully submitted. You can't be, you know, neither here nor there. You can't be a lukewarm Christian. You've got to be all in. Wiersbe says when a buck private, that's the lowest rank of a soldier, acts like a general, there is going to be trouble. Unconditional surrender is the only way to complete victory. If there is any area of the life kept back from God, there will always be battles. So submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So don't submit to the enemy, submit to God, flee from the devil. James is telling us here that you and I can actually resist Satan. In Ephesians 4.27, Paul says, do not give the devil a foothold. Satan needs a foothold in your life if he's going to fight against God. Now, that doesn't mean you accidentally left the back door open and, ooh, you know, the devil got in. Just by the way, as a, as a believer of Christ, you cannot be demon-possessed. You cannot have your thoughts and actions fully controlled by demons. Now, he tells us here that we can flee. That word foothold actually means an opportunity or a place. You're not meant to give the, the, the devil an opportunity to influence your life. He shouldn't have room to move because he's an enemy of God who wants to destroy God's people. And when you and I don't deal with sin, when we don't deal with pride and anger and envy and selfish ambition and self-obsession, it leaves room for the enemy to influence our lives. James is saying if you resist the devil, don't give him room to move, he will run away. Why? Because actually you and I are operating from a position of, of strength and victory because of what Jesus has already done. By the way, in Genesis 3, uh, you know, after we read about the, the story of creation, God's glory and, and His majesty, it's, it's an incredible thing to read. I want to remind you that the serpent makes a rather underwhelming entrance. The word says, now the serpent was a crafty little creature. <laughs> Yet often we can think of him as the, as the evil equivalent of God. He's not. Only God is omnipotent all-powerful. Only He is omniscient, all-knowing. Only He is omnipresent. I think some of us think, Man, I don't want to pray out loud, then the devil will know my plans. <laughs> He's got nothing on God. But He wants to destroy us. It's also good to remember that the first attack Satan makes is on the Word of God. He says to Eve, did God really say? And he doesn't deny that God has said something, but he twists the word of God, which is even more dangerous. The way to resist the devil long term, because he is relentless, you don't just resist him once, is to stay submitted to God, live according to the truth of his word, not your truth or my truth. There's only one truth. That is the truth of God. Another way to resist the devil is with the help of other believers, getting plugged into church, serving alongside other people, becoming part of the troop, 
becoming part of the army, journeying forward alone. Man, when I meet people who, who are isolated from the body and they, and they, and they do church in their own, I've never met anybody who's fully committed and fully submitted who does it on their own. I've only met people, I say, how, how have you been a Christian for longer than I've been alive? Plugged into church, seeing what God is doing in the lives of others. This is not a social club. This is a place where we come and we're equipped and we're, and we're encouraged to keep going because it's not easy. Amen? Don't go it alone if you want to resist the devil in your life. Verse 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Second part of the strategy, draw near to God. So we need to be under his authority, but we also need to be close to him. Submitted doesn't necessarily mean close. You can be submitted to your boss and do what they tell you because you don't want to get into trouble. You don't want to get fired. Some of us are like that with God. I'll submit to God. I'll listen to what he says because I, you know, I don't want to go to the other place. I want to go to heaven. But the purpose of submitting to God is so that you and I can be close to God. How do we do that? Well, first of all, by confessing our sins and asking God to cleanse us. James goes on to say, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In his essay, Nearness is Likeness, A.W. Tozer says, the more we are like God, the nearer we are to God. Wiersbe puts it like this. He says, I may be sitting in my living room with my Siamese cat on my lap, and my wife is 20 feet away in the kitchen, yet I'm nearer to my wife than I am to the cat. The cat is nothing like me. We have very little in common. You see, God draws near when you and I deal with the things that keep us at a distance. When we actually walk with Him. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't stumble. James tells us that we will all stumble. I don't know about you, but I'm at that age where I'm walking along, 45 years on the earth, and all of a sudden I'm like, in a shopping center, and then I stand there staring at the ground like, what did I just trip over? It was me. I tripped myself up. Now, some of you are young and you don't know what, that, what that's like yet, but it'll come. Sometimes we trip ourselves up. And that's okay as long as you are walking with God. Listen, drawing near to God is not a feeling. It's not a worship moment when you, you think you can feel the wings of the angels brushing along your, on, on your shoulders and you get goosebumps. That might just be the aircon. <laughs> drawing near to God is communion. It's relationship with Him, which is exactly what God wants. That's why He sent His only Son to die for you and I, to remove, the separation, to, 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 to remove what separates us from Him. So don't just be submitted to Him. Draw near to Him. It's what He wants. Verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Good grief. Now, this is common language in terms of the Hebrew prophets when there was this acknowledgement of sin and the anguish of repentance. How many of you know repentance is painful? But it's necessary. David Nystrom in the NIV application commentary says this. He says, in urging grief and a shift from laughter to mourning and joy to gloom, James reminds his readers that the false paths they thought would lead to true laughter and joy are dead ends that need to be abandoned. You know, when you and I draw near to God, you know what happens? Our sin is exposed. And this is what keeps a lot of people out of the presence of God. It's what keeps a lot of people from coming to church. But listen, it's a good thing when you recognize your own weakness. Because if you, if you allow it, there will be a washing, a purifying, and a making new. And when God does this washing, purifying, and making new, do you know what happens? You draw even closer to Him. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Third and final part of the strategy, stay humble before God. And this echoes verse 6 where James says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. 
Warren Wiersbe says, it is possible to submit outwardly and yet not be humbled inwardly. God hates the sin of pride. We often don't, we don't talk like that anymore, do we? We don't say the sin of this and the sin of that. We say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with this issue. Just a thought. God hates, I'm preaching to myself this morning, God hates the sin of pride and he will chasten the proud believer. He, he will rebuke and correct until he is humbled. We have a tendency to treat sin too lightly, even to laugh about it. That's why James says, let your laughter be turned into mourning. But sin is serious. And one mark of true humility is facing the seriousness of sin and dealing with our disobedience. Sometimes we hear a believer pray, O oh Lord, humble me. This is a dangerous thing to pray. Far better that we humble ourselves before God, confess our sins, weep over them, and turn from them. Listen, church, it's easier and less painful to humble yourself than to have God humble you. Trust me, I'm speaking from experience. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Verse 11, and he continues with this point of humility. He says, brothers and sisters, not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. So sometimes we can be more concerned with what other people are doing and, and their sin than we're actually worried about ourselves. And, and James is saying when you do that, you're actually above the law. Remember that James is speaking to Christians here, and these Christians are from a Jewish background, and they would have had a high respect for the Old Testament law. Verse 12, he says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Now here, James echoes the words of Jesus as he does throughout his letter in the Sermon on the Mount. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7 as we come to a close. Hope you've been helped. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It's the idea that when you and I come before the Lord, we want Him to, to dish out mercy and forgiveness with a petrol tanker. But then when it comes to us forgiving and showing mercy to others, we want to come with a teaspoon or a thimble. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't make any judgment calls or we never evaluate the actions or the sins of others. We often misquote this. Oh, well, who am I to judge? Well, if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? Well, I love the Holman New Testament commentary, it explains it like this, and I think it's, it's helpful. It says, it means do not judge others until you are prepared to be judged by the same standard. And then when you do exercise judgment towards others, do it with humility. Submit to God, draw near to God, and stay humble before God. Listen, when we follow these instructions from James, when we apply the strategy, God will be in authority in our lives because we're submitted to Him. He will draw near to us. Why? Because we are drawing near to Him. And then He will cleanse us. He will forgive us. And He will lift us up. And do you know what happens as a result? The wars in our lives will cease. No longer will we be at war with God. We won't always be at war with ourselves. And in turn, we won't wage war against each other.